that's okay. Right. Right, yeah. Three, two. Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about baptism. I hope that you were here at last week's service at Wolverton as we had a brilliant demonstration on baptism when seven people chose to get baptised. If you were here, then remember the excitement of everybody when each person was baptised and the joy on the faces of those that came up out of the water. For today's message, I want to note up front that baptism gets its meaning and its importance from the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in our place for our sins and from his triumph over death in the resurrection that guarantees our new and everlasting life. Baptism has meaning and importance only because the death and resurrection of Jesus are infinitely important for our rescue from the wrath of God. We're not talking about a religious ritual or just about church tradition here. We're mainly talking about Jesus Christ and his magnificent work of salvation in dying for our sins and rising for our justification. Talking about baptism means talking about how Jesus taught us to express our faith in Jesus and his great salvation. We will read the account of John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. A friend recently said to me, do you want to hear God speaking to you? Then read the Bible. Do you want to hear God's audible voice? Then read it out loud. So we're going to read from Matthew chapter 3. However, an interesting point is that only two of the Gospels have the account of Jesus' birth. Yet all four Gospels have the story of John the Baptist. As we are reading, have a think about why baptism is so important. So if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and had a leather belt round his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptise you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from the Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptised by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptised by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us all to fulfil all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptised, immediately he went up out of the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you. That is your word, you speaking. And these were your first recorded words um, in your ministry. Um, Lord, let us just unpack this this morning, unpack what you want to say to us in terms of baptism and speak to us clearly through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So in preparation for today, I was very conscious that the more I research this subject, the more I realised there is so much more to say on this, and definitely more that anyone can give justice in one session. As I've delved, in, delved into the topic, it's also clear there are a number of views which at times seem to be polarised about every aspect of baptism, where, when, how, why and what. The good thing is that despite these um, uh, divisions about the subject, it shows that Christians recognise that baptism is a serious matter and one in which we should discuss. And as Christians that take our faith seriously, we also take baptism seriously. So let's have a look at John's baptism and um, a bit about the Old Testament. Baptism is first mentioned in the Bible with John the Baptist. John came preaching a baptism of repentance. He was the link between the Old Testament and the New. There had been a period of 400 years when no prophetic voice had been heard. And then, as we've just read, the whole town, city, region, went out to the wilderness to hear John preach and to be baptised by him. From what we know, the people would line up on one side of the river of Jordan and come through the waters, being baptised and join the other side of the river. This was the river that the Israelites walked through, led by Joshua to the Promised Land several hundred years before. Can you imagine how long it would take for us to have a baptism service if each person had to confess their sins publicly before being baptised? One of the things that we look at was just the theologians and rulers of the day. John's call for the Jewish people to present themselves at the Jordan River to be baptised was scandalous. Why? Well, when a Gentile converted to Judaism, they had to embrace the tenets and doctrines of Judaism, including circumcision. In addition, they had to undergo a ritual that had developed during the intervening period, a ceremonial bath of purification known as the proselyte baptism. This rite of purification was administered to Gentile converts because the Jews considered the Gentiles to be ceremonially unclean. The Jews, by contrast, were considered to be clean, so they were not required to undergo any sort of cleansing rite. But when John called them to be baptised, the Pharisees were outraged by his implication that the Jews were unclean. That's why John challenged the leaders, as they did not understand the change in the times. There was an urgency of getting the people ready for the coming of the Messiah. Hence, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's have a look at the Old Testament, as although baptism isn't expressly mentioned, there is a strong pattern of likeness to baptism in the Old Testament. The design pattern that links through to Jesus is one of God providing salvation through water. This passage in Matthew that we have read is full of linkages to the Old Testament. Let's have a look at the few of the water salvation types within the Old Testament. For example, right on the first page of the Bible in Genesis where the Spirit of God hovers over the water, the start of the creative process. Likewise, baptism involves water and the Spirit of God. Baptism is a sign of a new creation. In Noah's Ark, that too is a picture of baptism. The story was of an impending judgment for which there was only one way of escape, and that was in the ark. The ark is a picture of Jesus so that in the ark, you can pass safely through the waters of judgment. Outside of the ark, you would be destroyed, but in the ark, you are safe. There is a new life, the other side of the waters. Then with Moses, he was in his own little ark at the beginning of his life, a vehicle that transported him to safety. However, the key story is the rescue of the Israelites through the Red Sea on dry ground. The Israelites had been set free by the blood of the Passover lamb while still in Egypt, but it was the waters of baptism that finally separated them from the Egyptians. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29, by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do so, the same were drowned. It is by faith that we are saved, but also by faith we enter into baptism. Interestingly, Moses leading the Israelites through the Red Sea then had a period of 40 years in the wilderness. Likewise, Jesus going through his baptism 
is immediately followed with 40 days of wilderness living. I think back to my own baptism and it's like a memorial stone that I can look back on and know that by faith, God was with me. This is the final picture of baptism I want to mention from the Old Testament. When Joshua had led the Israelites through the Jordan, he got each tribe to take a stone from the Jordan and set it up as a memorial. It's in Joshua chapter four and verses five to seven. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Maybe you need to tell your children today about your baptism and what it meant to you. Just as an aside, John the Baptist described Jesus in John's gospel, um, John uh, chapter one and verse 30, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the Old Testament, if someone had sin in their life and they brought a lamb as a sin offering, that lamb was carefully examined by the priest because the lamb could not be accepted if it was blind or had any kind of blemish, to see if the lamb was acceptable. The priest did not examine the person who brought the offering, he only examined the lamb. In the same way, our father does not look at us, he only looks at the lamb of God to see if the lamb is acceptable. And it's so good to know that Jesus is acceptable. So why get baptised? First of all, we believe that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord. What we mean by this is that the Lord Jesus commanded it. He ordained it in a way that make it a, an ongoing practice of the church. We find this most explicitly in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Make disciples is the main verb, having gone make disciples of all nations. The divining participles are baptizing them and teaching them. So the church is commanded to do this for all disciples. Making disciples of all nations includes baptizing them. And the time frame is defined by the promise of Christ's help in verse 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The promise of help is for as long as this age lasts. So the command he promised to help us with is as long as this age lasts. So baptism is a command, an ordinance of the Lord Jesus to be performed in making disciples until Christ returns at the end of the age. Next, baptism expresses union with Christ in his death and resurrection. The clearest teaching on this is in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In the wider context of Romans, I think it would be a mistake to say that water baptism is the means of our being united to Christ. In Romans, faith is the means by which we are united to Christ and justified. But we show this faith with the act of baptism. Faith unites to baptism and baptism symbolises the union. An analogy would be to say when someone gets married, with this ring I thee wed. When we say that, we don't mean that the ring or the putting on of the ring on the finger is what makes us married. No, it shows that the covenant and symbolizes the covenant, but the covenant making vows make the marriage. So it is with faith and baptism. Next, we believe this expression of union with Christ in death and resurrection happens by being immersed in water. 
The clearest evidence for this is in Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, which describes the act of baptism as burial and rising from the dead. This is most naturally understood to mean that you are buried under water and then come out of the, from the water to signify rising from the grave. The word baptism in Greek means dip or immerse. And most scholars agree that this is the way the church, the early church, practiced baptism. There are a few other pointers to immersion besides the meaning of the word and the imagery of death and burial. In Acts chapter 8, verses 37 to 38, the Ethiopian eunuch comes to faith while riding with Philip in his chariot and says, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptised? Philip agrees and it says, He commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water. Philip and the eunuch and he baptised him. Then they went down into water makes most sense if they were going down to immerse him. Next, baptism means doing this immersing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This means that not just any immersing is baptism. There is a holy appeal to God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to be present in this act and make it true and real in what it says about the work in redemption. There is no salvation without the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we call on their name, we depend upon them and honour them and say that this, is, this act is because of them and by them and for them. So when the shift happened in redemptive history from the old covenant to the new covenant and from circumcision to baptism, there was a shift from an ethnic focus on Israel and only males being given the sign of membership in the people to a spiritual focus on the church of all nations with both male and female being given the sign of membership in the people, namely baptism. Membership in the new covenant people of God is not by physical birth, but by spiritual birth. That new birth happens by the word of God, the gospel. Therefore, the church should be composed not of the believers and their infants, but believers only. And the sign of membership in the new covenant um, people is not a sign for infants, but a sign for believers. So we can see how the meaning of baptism is woven together with membership in the people of God. And since the local church is an expression of that people, baptism is closely connected to membership in the local church. In the New Testament, being a Christian, being baptized, belonging to a new covenant people of God, and being a member of a local church were linked together. If you tried to pull one of those out, not a Christian, not baptized, not in the new covenant people, or not a member of a local church, it would make no sense. They belong together. So baptism is important. It was uncompromisingly commanded by the Lord Jesus. It was universally administered to Christians entering the early church. It was uniquely connected to conversion as an unrepeatable, expression of saving faith. So just finally, baptism in the Bible expresses an identification with Christ's death and resurrection. The old self was crucified with Christ through the waters of death and now followers of Jesus have risen with him in newness of life. I would urge you this morning, if you've not been baptised, there will be another chance. We had one last weekend, there will be another chance. Um, do speak to one of the leaders here at New Life um, Church, Milton Keynes, about what that means for you and when you can then get baptised. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you demonstrated baptism. You didn't need to have a baptism of repentance, but you said it was to fulfil all righteousness. We give you honour, we give you thanks, we give you just the glory for what you're doing in each of our lives. And I pray that this morning you will just speak to those who are thinking about baptism, who are thinking about um, what that means, that something today will have spoken to them. Lord, and for those of us that have been baptised, that we would remember what it was that you did in our lives. We would have that memorial stone and we would talk to our children, talk to our friends, talk to our neighbours about what baptism means to us. God, you're so good and we love you.
Amen.